So I just met Muhammad. Muhammad, where are you? It's amazing to get to meet you. Um, I was, I'm studying Singapore right now, and it's an interesting place, my first time. And uh, I noticed it's so peaceful here, and um, it felt like a different versions of different countries I've been in. And when I was walking with Muhammad, he was saying how, you know, this place, everything is on time. Everything is precise, everything works really well. And if you go to a different place, it doesn't work as well. It's more chaotic. And we both agree that if you're in a place with too much order, you somehow remove the creativity in it. Whereas if you're in chaos, there's a lot of creativity and less execution. So just that kind of balance I find really a, a question, and maybe you're trying to ask that question. Secondly, I'm a big fan of the product function because I see the product function as extremely creative because it's able to enable the chaos, at the same time provide execution. But it's about that balance. It's a really great place to be. And so I was so glad when I was able to have the opportunity to come here, thanks to Martin and team, uh, to talk with all of you. So what am I going to talk about? Well, uh, Mohammed said, you know, there's this thing on the internet about you. I said, what do you mean? Um, you know, there's people talking about stuff. I said, oh, that. Well, um, I recently produced the Design and Tech Report. It's my fifth year. And it's been talking about digital products in the age of the computational era. And um, uh, I could give it to you here, but I don't believe that giving you the same information that's all available on the web is useful. So I have it in six or seven flavors. The easiest, bless you, the easiest flavor is YouTube. I have been be I've become a YouTuber, so I have a 17-minute abridged version. If you watch that, you're all set. I have a two-hour version, hour version, but that's the best product so far. Um, but what Muhammad was saying is there's all this stuff about me online, which is kind of uh, interesting. I'm now uh, being trolled from all sectors of the universe right now. Um, it's because uh, a, a periodical ran an interview about me, you know what an interview is? You talk to someone on the phone for 20 minutes, and then they say that, don't worry, we'll let you fact check, but they never send you what they're going to publish. Um, so anyways, this article went online, and um, uh, something I said in, uh, in the interview became the headline, which sounds derogatory to designers. It says, design doesn't matter, basically. So you know this thing called clickbait? Clickbait? It's like so delicious. You know, like, you know, it's so, uh, but also people don't read anything too. The clickbait is kind of enough. Like, there's no need to click on it. It's like, oh, I've been baited, I'm set. Um, and so I have a host of people online who are uh, understandably angry. Um, this is Hartmut, he founded Frog Design. So uh, that's kind of like old school anger. Uh, and I have every flavor of anger out there. Um, <laughs> I have people, you know, you know, there's no effigies yet, luckily, but uh, people are out there and have feelings about this, and it's, it's good that I'm learning so much about the spectrum of dissatisfaction and the spectrum of semi-agreement with something that people think I said, and isn't that what we do when we have a product? We want to understand our user base, and so I'm getting the largest spectrum view of all the users of anything that I've ever done for the last 10 years. And it's fascinating. And I don't take it lightly, mind you. I'm curious, like, oh, that's how you think that, and that's how you think that. So it's extremely useful. And um, I can respond to a few people. People are upset that I'm not responding to the hundreds, now thousands of people. But I don't have time. I'm busy. I like to do work. So if you are upset at me out there, I, I can't respond to you. I'm sorry. But I am listening. Um, I, uh, I wrote back to Hartmut. I said, did you read the interview? And first of all, did you remember it's an interview? Which means everything I said can be taken out of context. 
Um, and uh, I like how Fast Company can make a, a thing where it looks like I said that line there, but I didn't say that. But it's so that even the visual can be misleading, too. Uh, so what I love about this, though, is I can say what I said. Uh, what I was said was basically what Martin was saying, which is that making products is a team effort. And uh, you don't talk to a goalie on a soccer team, and the soccer doesn't say, I'm goalie-led. They don't do that. Or even the striker doesn't say, I'm striker-led. Um, they also like, I'm just a support person on the team. And so that's my take on that. So, um, but why is this happening right now? What it underlies all it is, I believe, Moore's Law. And Moore's Law has frustrated the creation of products and companies. And Moore's Law is completely invisible. And it's also not really a law. So people spend time wasting debating over Moore's Law because it's not a physical law. But what is it? It says that computing speed doubles roughly a year, year to half. And that's been happening since the 70s. And my favorite example is the chessboard example. In the chessboard example, the chessboard example is if you have a chessboard and you double the number of, the story goes that someone, who, whoever, whoever invented chess, uh, the king or whatever said, I will pay you. And so the person who made it said, oh, I'm a very humble game maker. Just give me one grain of rice for each checkerboard piece, but just double it each time. So the king's like, oh my gosh, that's such a deal. So if you take one grain of rice at the first uh, square and you double it, it's only 128. But if you keep doubling it, it gets to really big numbers. So what does that mean? It means halfway through the checkerboard, it's uh, 2 <laughs> billion times. It's 2 billion pieces of rice. That's a lot of rice, right? And if you think about computers, computers are 2 billion times faster than they were a few decades ago. Doesn't make any sense. Imagine a car you bought in the 1970s, like Captain Marvel era. And you bought the car, it went 80 miles per hour, it cost $15,000, right? Now, in 2019, you buy the same kind of car, it costs about the same. But in 2019, the computer you buy is 2 billion times faster and less the cost. That's unusual and abnormal, and that abnormality is disrupting business, it's disrupting design, and product is the one function that understands that this strange thing has occurred and is trying to create balance. Because these numbers are huge. And why do all the pure developers get excited? Or why does Elon Musk say AI is coming? It's because you push forward and you get a gigantic number. Uh, what is it? It's not thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. Quintillions. It's nine quintillions faster by roughly 2040. That's pretty fast, and we cannot fathom that. So singularity, etc. people believe it's likely to happen because it's unlikely that a computer decades ago could be two billion times faster, but it is. So it is likely that computing will increase at this speed. That's kind of scary, but it's also interesting. And it's for that reason, I am writing a book called How to Speak Machine, and I have to work on it. That's why I'm not responding to all, everyone online, <laughs> because it's just, uh, it's, uh, anyways. Um, but uh, this book lays out for anyone how computer science works. And if people can understand how computer science works, not computer coding, I believe people will be able to be less afraid of what is invisible. And we can get back to work, because this invisible gas is scary to a lot of people, it's changing their disciplines, and it's freaking a lot of people out, understandably. And so I want to somehow contribute to counteracting that, and uh, I'll give this a try. We'll see how that goes. Um, ever since I've worked with product people, especially since the uh, dinner and hanging out with this community here, this, this wonderful product community, is I hear the word leadership over and over, and I'm a fan of leadership. So how many of you are leaders? Raise your hand, right? You're leaders. And some of you who haven't raised your hand, you will probably be stuck in the position of being a leader. And it's a great problem to have. And some people become leaders, some people don't. 
It's totally okay. But leadership looks a certain way. So if you've ever been to a fancy, you know, the government, who's been to a like, special government function before? Right? It's got so nice, right? Nice dishes, nice, you want to take it, but you can't because they're watching you. <laughs> and it's, everything is fancy, fancy. You know, this is when I was at the White House. This, you know, Michelle Obama back then. It was like, oh, fancy, fancy, you know? And so power looks like amazing. That's what power looks like. It's like, whoa, power, less power. <laughs> um, and power says don't do something. Right? So this is my favorite don't do sign at the White House. It's like no photography, no videotaping. I like the no stun guns. Um, like, yeah, I'm going to the White House for a function. I'm bringing my stun gun along. Um, so like, don't do all this. So no means no. And so leadership usually says don't do that. Who likes being told don't do that? Like nobody does, right? Like he tell that to kids, revolt, right? They'll scream at you, literally. Um, this is in uh, Tokyo, back when there was Tsukiji. I love this one. It says, no big luggage. Because uh, the tourists would go to Tsukiji. It's a fish market. So no, no, right? Uh, this is an old sign from St. Petersburg in Russia. This is the all-time best no sign. Uh, this says, like, no plants. Can you imagine going to a national area, bringing a plant like, yeah, you know, right? So like, they've covered everything, you know? Uh, and also, no love. <laughs> so that's what power is like. No, 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 and it feels kind of bad. And you as product leaders, or design leaders, or developer leaders, know that when you tell someone no, it gets a little bit, a little bit dicey, right? But you have to say no, right? But you can't say no. So how do you do that? And the problem today is that the old way of leadership was, I'm right. Did you hear me? I'm right. And I'm going to pound my fist and say I'm right, and then you're going to listen to me. Whereas the new leadership model is, I don't really know if I'm right. And then someone else says, I don't think you're right. I just Googled it. I read a Medium post, <laughs> right? And I read so-and-so influencer blog, so you're wrong. And you're like, oh, gosh, I'm wrong. And you sit there, and you blog about how you might be wrong. <laughs> and then it's like, it's stuck in a thing. But over here, it was like, Drucker said, I'm right. So I'm right, and I read the HBR thing, and I'm right. Oh, my gosh, you're at HBR. You're right. It's easy, okay? That easy world is vanishing. It's eroding, and probably for the best, but also really hard if you're over here. Um, and when you think about how we lead, um, if you lead in a startup versus what I call an end up, you know, like a, a startup is like so brand new. An end up is that big company that already ended up successful. You know, an end up is like so different. And startups make fun of end ups. Like, ah, oh, that end up, yeah, but the startup wants to become an end up. And they end up, says, oh my gosh, that startup is so amazing. It's a, it's a weird kind of like you always want what you don't have. So like a startup is agile, and end up is stable. Like a startup has nothing to lose, whereas an end up has everything to lose. Don't make any mistake. We're going to lose everything. A startup is a flat structure, totally empowered. But an end up is like command and control, right? Because that's easier to propagate commands. Whereas over here, it's like, I don't have to listen to you. So a different model. And neither is perfect, right? Sometimes you have to borrow uh, uh, a modes from each side. And uh, I was talking with Ken um, just yesterday about leadership. And this is a model of leadership that I developed I presented it at the World Economic Forum, uh, and I never got invited back afterwards. So uh, probably indicates the knowledge quality may be uh, you know, somewhat uh, uh, sketchy. But um, I believe that anyone who leads anything that is not a startup, an end up, or a startup after its first two, three years of running, you have this thing called a past. 
And the past is a heavy weight. And a leader, why does a leader feel, why is it hard to sleep as a leader? And the best description I can have for those who lead, who know it, is it's like a thing on your chest that will not let go. It's like you're this, oh my gosh, this is pain. And it doesn't go away. If you quit or you get fired, it goes away. It's so awesome. But when you're, when you're in it, you're like, oh my gosh, this thing, what is it? I gotta get rid of it. I can drink, I can do whatever. It's not going away. I watched, uh, I read, a, I, I saw a good Brene Brown talk. I'm feeling better, but not. It's like, it's just not going away, right? So um, I think a leader is like on a seesaw. They are that fulcrum and they are stuck in the present. So the pain on your chest is the fact that you're the fulcrum. And there's a, a game being played around you that you don't know, where everyone's watching you. Um, because you know, they kind of want you to win, but they kind of don't want you to win at the same time. You're laughing, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> so this thing is heavy, this thing, this thing. And you're supposed to make the momentum go to the future. I can tell you're feeling it. This is like therapy right now. Um, <laughs> and this ball is going to go in one of two directions, depending upon you. And so, like, there are three scenarios. Maybe this is why they never invite me back. Three scenarios is, number one, you move the organization to the future. That's the you won. Ah! You know, ta-da emoji. It's like, great. You know, everyone high-fiving you. It's awesome. You know, that's rarely the case. <laughs> um, more often, what happens is the past is so powerful. No, 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 we tried that in the past. No, so-and-so did that. No, no, that's going to fail. You know, it's in the guide thing, whatever, you know. And like, ah, Past wins. The past has the most high fives, but they're all hiding behind your back. It's so good, and you feel bad. But no one tells you about scenario three. I've seen no post about this. Scenario three is game over. <laughs> it's like, you lose, right? And that is the one that is so hard to know, because no book tells you about it. Why is that? Um, I got my MBA because I was tired of people telling me I'm the creative one, so don't worry about the money. By the third person who told me that, I got worried about the money. So I got my MBA because of that. And I began like, looking at the fact that no one talks about failure, failure. Not like you know, Zuckerberg failure, like, whoa, failure, failure. No one's like, failure, failure. <laughs> There's no HBR article at all about failure, failure. Who knows what I'm talking about, about failure, failure? Come on. Yeah, you know what? Failure, failure. There's no article about that because they would never get any shares. No clickbait. You know, how to fail at work. You know, <laughs> wouldn't work. So people who are in that situation, though, I believe they are uniquely robust. I'm a believer in creative leadership. It's why I think 10 years ago I got the domain um, because I felt it was important somehow. Uh, so a traditional leader is a typical HBS style leader, old school HBS. And there's a creative leader that comes from some kind of creative thing, maybe a humanist point of view, a more liberal arts take. And the traditional leader is a symbol of, of authority, but a creative leader is a symbol of inspiration. It's quite different, authority versus inspiration. A traditional leader is about yes or no. But a creative leader is OK with maybe. The ambiguity. A uh, traditional leader really wants to be right because it looks really good. A creative leader is concerned with being real, making the real decision. And it's hard to be there because often it doesn't look right. A traditional leader follows the manual. A creative leader knows that improv improvisation is important. A traditional leader loves to avoid mistakes. Why again? because it looks bad, and also it could be catastrophic in many cases, so they can't afford to do that. It's mission critical. But a creative leader loves to learn from mistakes. It's like a, someone asked me why I'm so robust when terrible things happen to me. It's because I trained myself to be that way, 
it's conscious training. And um, I uh, have a, a friend who's a dear friend of that person on TED, Ben Zanders, amazing uh, conductor. Um, and uh, apparently, Ben, any calamity, when any calamity comes his way, he says three words immediately. He says, oh, how fantastic. And by training himself to be in that state, it isn't that he's like being a Pollyanna and thinking it's all going to be great, but he's like, how fantastic. And that activates your creative ability, your improvisation ability, you know, but also the realistic part of you that realizes you might not make it. A traditional leader wants to be right. A creative leader knows that the best you can do is hope to be right. Um, that can drive people around you somewhat bonkers sometimes because they want you to be right. But you're like, I gotta be honest with you. I, I hope this is right. And I think that's good training for anyone right now because if you watch the Moore's Law growth thing, Everything in the future is going to be changing so rapidly that no one can pretend to know what's coming next. And that pretense is not a safe position to be in, I believe. So, um, other point about leadership. Uh, everyone talks about how important transparency is. Be transparent. But one of my dear friends, Jesse Sheffern, once said, no, it's about being clear. The two words seem really similar, but transparency isn't really useful. Transparency is, here I'm being transparent. Clarity means something completely different. And so I love when she said to me, clarity is transparency plus understanding. The understanding, however, takes time. You know, it takes time. Like, have you ever tried to make a point and someone just read the headline? They didn't read the whole report? Right? And then you say, or you say, like, let's just sit and talk, and like, no, I've already read your headline, and therefore your idea is terrible. Um, that's how the world works. So getting to understanding takes time. It takes the relationship building, which is easy when you have two or three people to relate to. It gets harder when you have a few hundred. It gets close to near impossible when you have 10,000. And that's a challenge, right, of leading. Now, Kim Scott, dear friend, I'm a huge fan, Radical Candor. Who's the Radical Candor? Radical Candor? It's a great framework. The framework works care personally, challenge directly. This lower one, manipulative sin insincerity, is the bad one, you can tell. Obnoxious aggression, also a bad one, but quite common. Uh, ruinous empathy, most common because you want to be nice to that person, but this quadrant, Radical Candor, is that sweet spot of caring about someone personally and giving feedback. Very hard because it's culturally different, it's case by case by person, every person's background is different. So I look at what Kim says as something I have to iterate around constantly. But I made my own framework based upon Kim's. Uh, I call it radical renewal. It's about organizations. So this axis has lots to lose. This axis is willingness to change. An organization is ready to change. An organization has lots to lose. This quadrant over here, I call, no thanks, I'm too busy. It's like, oh, you know, I'm busy. I got stuff to do. This quadrant here is thoughtless adoption. Oh, yeah, I love it. Let's go. Right? This quadrant here is stubborn resistance, the most popular television program. And the last one is radical renewal. And I look at getting to that quadrant, to lead into that quadrant, is the goal. It's hard to get there because of these three other types of interference patterns. So, um, this was also at the World Economic Forum, so maybe this is another reason why. Anyways, um, so every tome about leadership is all about, like, you take your team, you get them ready, you climb the mountain together, and it's awesome. And you plant the flag, and you did it, right? So I, always, so I thought it was odd how it's always about getting up the mountain, and like you did it. But in reality, no one tells you that leadership is not about climbing the mountain. It's about jumping off the mountain. 
Because in reality, it's like you do it. And everyone's wondering, are they going to survive? And they're wondering, are you going to hit the pond or not? And everyone's curious. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I think so. I heard nervous laughing. Um, but sometimes you land in the pond and you're reborn. And you get up and you get out. And you're like, oh, I can do this. And leaders have this ridiculous thing in their brain where they go back up the mountain again. <laughs> you know? They're like, I'll do it again. It's awesome. Um, uh, but each time, will they survive? Dot, dot, dot. Maybe in Singapore it's different here. Maybe everyone's cheering for you. But for anyone who leads, uh, who fails, who seeks to recover, what is it? The, I, I like to say I don't believe in fail fast. I believe in recover fast. Recover fast is so key. And if any of you are experiencing, I won't ask you to raise your hand because that's hard, but I'm sure if you are going through a difficult leadership situation right now, close to the point of abject failure, so having so much doubt in you, unsure of what to do next. Um, I always uh, prescribe uh, the work of John W. Gardner. There's an essay that's free online. Um, it's uh, on pbs.org. You just search for it. Um, I've kept a local copy in case our US government uh, stops funding PBS for some reason. Um, but in the essay, he says this thing. He says, there's something I know about you that you may or may not know about yourself. And John Garner passed away roughly 10 years ago. Uh, he was the Health and Human Secretary, Services Secretary to Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, highly regarded leader. Um, something you may not know about yourself. You have within you more resources of energy than you ever have ever been tapped, more talent than has ever been exploited, more strengths than has ever been tested, more to give than you have ever given. And I'll tear up every time I read it. It's, it's, it's what I think that all of us have in ourselves to draw upon. When everyone's cheering you for you to not succeed on behalf of all of them, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it isn't about you, but you have to find yourself in that to find that strength to get back up. You know, when Nelson Mandela passed away, there were so many amazing quotes that were shared about him that he said. And my favorite one is, um, don't judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. So I believe that is the question we have for leading today. Now, what's the problem, though? So roughly 15 years ago, I was asked by a friend on stage, like a big event, a question. And sometimes you're asked a question, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to some questions from Martin shortly, and you make a really dumb answer. And you like leave and like, oh my gosh, that was a terrible answer because I didn't know what I was saying. So I spent the rest of the half year trying to figure out what was the correct answer. I was asked, What's the difference between audacity and courage? And I didn't, have, I didn't know what, that, what the difference was. Some of you seem to know it, but I didn't know it at the time. The difference is quite simple. Audacity means not knowing what you're getting into and just doing it, and it's awesome. Courage means knowing what you're getting into and going into it. They're two different things. Audacity is... I'm going to get in a supermarket, carry firecrackers, go downhill, chew gum, stand, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> that is audacity, usually attributed to youth. Like, woo, nothing to lose, let's go. But courage is, I've seen this happen before. It's happened to me once, twice, maybe 10 times. I know exactly what it's going to mean. I know exactly how difficult it's going to be but I choose to enter it. That's courage. And so courage is a powerful thing to tap into. And often audacity is a great way to kickstart it. So I like to be audacious to start, but quickly switch to courage. Otherwise, I know I'm likely to expire. So um, I have four professional goals in life. 
I wrote them down in a meeting where I was, uh, how do you say, it's tired. You know, uh, when you have forces around you, it gets you tired sometimes. You know what I'm talking about? The, the negative forces. Um, and so I wrote down uh, thicker skin 75 times. Just to kind of like, you know, build that skin inside me. This, by the way, sold for an auction in Paris, a uh, charity auction. So it also had a good purpose. My stress turned into uh, funds for whatever. But anyways, that's a good way to turn your stress into something good for humankind, I think. But um, at the time, I wrote down my four goals in life. And I've stuck with them, and then now they're legal. They're over 18. Um, and they're quite simple. The first is don't speak ill of others. The second is avoid passive-aggressive behavior. The third one is, listen broadly and don't waffle on decisions. And the fourth is, when an error, admit you made the error, apologize, and move forward. Now, I don't follow these rules so well, um, and so that's why I bring them out and show them to people and talk to them to people so I can remind myself what I, I'm aspiring to do, so I'm not perfect in that way. Um, and to close out, I, I don't know, all of you in Singapore, there's someone named Milton Tan. Who knows Milton Tan's name? No? He doesn't have, you can't find him online so easily, but he's the reason why Singapore went so full in design. Uh, passed away at the age of 56. Another person, uh, one, of the, one of the forefathers of design thinking, Bill Mogridge, a dear friend, he said that design is uh, simply about the people. And Milton Tan, uh, really the person in Singapore who got design going, pointing to how design is about, not about talent, but it's about the community of talent. So I want to leave you on that note that um, dead people will happen all the time for you. Like everyone you thought was really interesting, once they die, they vanish. I like to say that when you die, your SEO goes to shit. Um, it's true. Um, so it's good to remember people. That's why people don't notice that in all my rebuttal things, I'm posting uh, an article that I, 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 the article I wrote has this, has this hidden like Easter egg where I'm basically telling them, good, but when I'm gone, you'll forget me, it'll be okay. So that's all. Let's have a chat, Mark. Hello. Thank you so much. So uh, I love the emphasis on leadership and on people. It's something we talk a lot about. Uh, I think we were saying this just before we went on stage, the kind of running inside joke in product is that we have all the responsibility and none of the authority. So like, what are your best techniques for figuring out how to influence through leadership as opposed to authority and uh, the saying no and all those signs? Yeah. Um, well, uh, it, it took me a while to learn this, so maybe all of you knew this, but I never knew that if people are really against you, no matter what you do, you're not going to change their mind. Um, I think when you're an overachiever, you think you can like solve everything. Um, but people that are valently against whatever you're doing, you can spend like hours and days and they're not going to be convinced. Meanwhile, you lose the opportunity to talk to those who already are convinced. And so if you're trying to influence, um, try to resist the ability to address the pain. Like, if I were to come over here, Martin, like, hitch, kick you, whatever, like, oh my gosh, he kicked me, it hurts, you know? Meanwhile, there's all the people here you're gonna, you're gonna forget about, <laughs> right? So we tend to focus on the pain, don't focus on the opportunity. So would you say that at some point you just have to give up and like, I can't change this person's mind and either yes. quit, move on? You quit, move else? on. <laughs> uh, it's so hard to do yeah. because you're thinking like, oh, but this is such an important thing. But then you realize that the more hours and days, is, I, by the way, I do this all the time, so I'm not saying I'm perfect in that way. I, I, I for, forget, oh, this is never going to correct itself, and I'm wasting too much time here. It's, it's always a challenge, though, right? Because inevitably, we have stakeholders around us, we have leadership above us, um, we have, you know, even if you're the CEO, uh, you have somebody to answer to. Um, shareholders and everything else. So at some point, like, how do you find the right balance of like, how much should you push? How much audacity should you have versus like, okay, I'm not going to be able to do this and move on. Well, it's funny. We were like, talking to Ken last night, speaking later. Um, 
You know, you remember there was a, maybe a different age. Do you know this is called a rabbit? It used to be okay to carry a rabbit foot around. Sounds gross, doesn't it? Ugh. Like for luck. Um, I believe that you're always playing a game of luck. It's a game of chance. And sometimes the video game works out where like all the walls open up at the right time. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you've done the right thing, so you're right there ready for when the things open up. Um, but it really is a game of chance. That's why I believe the, the competency is about recovery. Because the likelihood that you won't make it to the right time where they're supposed to, like in the matrix, teleport you, um, it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. And is that where the courage comes in? Is kind of taking that leap, taking that chance? I, well, I, I think to, 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 to jump into the opportunity, you have to have audacity, because that's a good way to go, because that's like exciting. But I think once you step into it, switch to like rational thinking, um, be courageous, I reach into, I'm, I, I imagine when I talked to you on the phone a few months ago, the community you've built has been successful because it's people who can all relate to each other. And that's how you deal with stress, right? You have you build a community. Yep, and we all need the therapy as product people, so we get it best from each other, I think. So how, again, so if you're jumping into it with courage, if you need that courage, like where, where's the line between courage and kind of hubris and overconfidence, right? I think we see a lot of startups in the US, maybe specifically, that kind of have overconfidence and overbelief in, in what they're building and what they're doing. How do you kind of know what counts as courageous in, in the positive sense and what might you know, be hubristic? Oh, well, you know, I, I, I'm really jealous of people who are like super confident and like, you know, don't believe they're ever wrong. In a way, I'm jealous because it's like a really happy place to be. Um, but I don't ascribe to that. So I like to stay here where I, where I feel comfortable. And just being aware that sometimes, like in a time of crisis, you want someone who like thinks that they're right, knowing that they might be wrong, but everyone has to align. Yeah. But in times of non-crisis, um, that, that approach is not agile. It's not listening. That's what uh, Jeff Gotthelp was talking about, how agile is not about like lean, whatever. It's about learning. Yeah. Yeah, one of our favorite speakers on the Mind Products stage is Tom Chi, who is the original designer behind Google Glass. And he was railing against kind of l failing fast and said that we should be aiming to learn fast instead. Yeah. So how, how do you kind of build that into your organization and into your kind of culture, really, to, yeah. be, to be about learning as opposed to shipping and building and... Oh, that's a really good question. Well, that's why uh, just with the new report, uh, I released something we've developed at Automatic called the Four Planets model. Uh, what is it? It's like any other model, but uh, I use planets because uh, we use planets because they're p places of gravity, and I think developer-centric cultures love what we call planet deliver. It's the awesomest planet to be on. Everyone can high five each other. It's the best place. Pull request approved, out, yes! You know, it's like awesome. <laughs> it's the best place. And uh, if you're not on there, everyone's like, oh, you're a loser, right? So we've conceptualized there's actually four other planets. There is planet discovery, this barren planet <laughs> with very low gravity where you can learn about people through research. And there's planet hypothesis, slightly smaller planet where you can sort of calibrate, cater, focus, whatever. Then you go to Planet Deliver, but don't get stuck in Planet Deliver. You got to go to Planet Listen to see what happened after you deployed. And it isn't about go st landing on a planet. It's about being in orbits. Do you know uh, Pablo Picasso had a phase called the light painting phase, where he would take light and he would draw in photographs. And so the model is, it's about being in orbit and keep in motion. It is, I guess, being agile and learning throughout, throughout the path for planets. So is there any way, so I think the reason it's so nice and lovely on planet delivery is that it's easy to measure, right? Uh, how many pull requests, exactly. how many lines of code, exactly. we ship this many things, we so have this good. many story points in a sprint. High five. High five. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. The bell, the bell. But yeah. how do you, it's like sales, right? It's easy to measure, hey, it's easy. So inevitably in that journey from kind of startup, a couple of people around a table to an end up, a, a big company, you start having to measure things, you want OKRs and things, and they make sense that at some level, but is there any way to measure those other planets, like measuring discovery and measuring yeah. listening? And well, that's why I think a leader is able to provide gravity. And so I, leading design, uh, will say like, hey, come on over here. 
Gravity is really light. Come on. <laughs> Come on over here. And like, oh my gosh, that's a bad planet. I think this planet's kind of cool. Uh, and then we go over here. And then after we ship, whoa, planet, listen. Oh my gosh, dark, desolate. No one's here. Come on over here. <laughs> Come over here. And so that's the best you can do as a leader to, um, what is it, my favorite? The Pentagon. So, uh, so the Pentagon, noticing how someone, someone like the guides guy, they're all like generals or whatever, they have the, the, all the uniform. And they know the Pentagon so well that they can walk backwards with the whole group. Yeah. And I think of that as like a leadership metaphor. It's like if you're walking like this, you know, you don't know where they are. So you have to keep looking back, like which planets are you on? Come on over here. And I think that might be the perfect spot to end. So find your gravity, pull your team with you, find the better planet. Thank you so much, John Mato. Thank you. Thank you.